So very good today on emergency excerpts. Welcome everybody. I'm going to talk about managing the ventilator and we have to start off whenever we talk about management of ventilation, we have to start off with some just basic understanding about ventilator settings. So when we think about monitoring the ventilator, yes, I know you have a respiratory therapist. Yes, I know you don't really touch the ventilator, but it is part and parcel of your big clinical picture. So really important for us to have some basic understanding. So some key components when we're monitoring the ventilator, and remember, we're not making any changes, but we do need to understand the information so we know where to look for information and how to actually evaluate what's occurring for our patient who's intubated on and on mechanical ventilation. So the key components of this are really understanding what is the target of your mechanical ventilation, what mode you are using, and then looking at the settings, which are on the front panel of the ventilator, and the patient data, which is on the top panel of your display on your ventilator, and also appreciating and understanding the alarms, because of course, that is something that we're going to be very concerned with. When patients' alarms go off on the ventilator, what do they mean, and what should we be doing? So last, and really for me, first, last, and every day, is to evaluate your patient and really assure that the ventilator settings fit the patient and not the other way around, that you're not trying to make your patient fit the ventilator by aggressive sedation and analgesia. So step one really in uh, monitoring your ventilator is to appreciate what the target is. The target means that you're gonna flow gas into the airway, into the lung, you're gonna flow gas to an endpoint. So you don't give your patients volume, you don't give your patients pressure, you flow gas to a target. That target will either be volume or that target will be pressure, okay? So you're gonna flow gas into the lung to a target. Volume cycle, volume target, volume limited, volume control, all mean the same thing. Just gotta have a lot of words for it. And what that is, is you're gonna flow gas into the lung until you reach a certain volume. Now, as you flow gas into that lung until you reach that certain volume, that will be regardless of how compliant or stiff the lung is. So that's really important because what I'm gonna set is a volume I wanna give the patient and that's gonna happen regardless of the pressure that is generated. When lungs become a little bit stiffer, you definitely don't want to use volume control because you're going to be pushing volume into that stiff lung. So you will typically switch over to the other target. The other target is pressure. So again, pressure targeted, pressure limited, pressure control, pressure assist, all the same thing, um, flowing gas to a targeted pressure. Now, when the lung is stiff and small, we call it baby lung, you've got somebody with ARDS, they've got significant pulmonary edema, the lung is pretty stiff. So you're gonna flow gas to an acceptable target, meaning the volume is gonna be variable. So in volume control ventilation, you're gonna give that volume regardless of the pressure. And in pressure control ventilation, you're gonna flow gas to that pressure regardless of the volume. And that's really important because when we understand the difference between those two, we know what we should be looking for and at when we're caring for patients who are on a ventilator. Now, the other thing that's really important is mode. And mode is different than target. Target is volume or target is pressure. Mode is, and there's really only two modes, I'll say that again, probably multiple times, there's really only two modes of ventilator application. The first mode is assist and assist control. Assist control means that whenever the patient makes a respiratory effort, the ventilator assists, giving a full ventilator breath. So assist control means you're gonna set a mandatory rate if the patient attempts to take a breath beyond that mandatory rate, the ventilator will turn on and give them a full ventilated breath. That's called assist control. All breaths are administered to target and administered by the ventilator. Administered to target, 
and administered by the ventilator in assist control. Patient can ask for a breath because he's made an effort. The vent turns on, gives the breath to target, and it's controlled by the ventilator. So there's another form of ventilation known as SIMV, synchronized intermittent mechanical ventilation or intermittent mandatory ventilation. And synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation means that you're going to dial a rate, a, a rate of ventilation that you want to give your patient. So let's say you want to give your patient 12 breaths a minute from the ventilator. Those are targeted breaths, either volume or pressure. The ventilator will deliver those mandatory breaths. But if your patient makes an effort beyond that, that will be his own breath. Now you're gonna have some support from the ventilator. Typically it's called pressure support or volume support. The vent is supporting the patient, but the breath is not controlled. And all that means is there's a difference in the level of the target. So in a volume control breath, I'm gonna set a tidal volume of around six to eight mLs per kg. And in a volume supported breath, the patient's gonna get an assist from the ventilator at around two to four mLs per kg. In a pressure controlled breath, I'm going to set the pressure target to 40. So gas will flow into the lung till you reach that pressure of 40 and the breath shuts off. In a pressure supported breath, the vent will, when the patient makes his own effort, there'll be some gas flow to a much lower pressure target. So in pressure control, your pressure target is typically 35 to 40. And in pressure support, your target is typically 10 to 15, might be a little bit higher. So honestly, the only real concepts in terms of appreciating mode and target, target is volume and pressure. Mode is every breath is a vent breath, even when the patient asks for it, or you have a mandatory rate, but then the patient can also breathe spontaneously between the mandatory rate. And if the patient makes an effort within about 0.5 seconds of the time, the mandatory breath should be turned on. The vent is going to say, I accept it. I'm going to give you your mandatory breath synchronized to your effort. And that's why we call that synchronized intermittent mechanical ventilation. So either on assist control or SIMV, either one can be volume targeted or pressure targeted or volume control, pressure control. And patients can be just breathing spontaneously with only pressure support. So you don't have any mandatory breaths there. Patient's taken all his own breaths, but he has a very low target. The gas flows into the lung to a pressure of about 20, or 50, I'm sorry, about 15. And what that does is it opens up the airways and makes it easier for the patient to breathe. So that's really important when we have that appreciation. Okay, so that other mode that I just talked about, pressure support, you can also give pressure support when you're, you, you're giving patients BiPAP. You can give them BiPAP non-invasively. You can give BiPAP invasively. All that means is that the ventilator augments their patient's respiratory effort. I make an effort, the gas flow turns on to a target of whatever the pressure support has been set at. 10, 12, 15. If you get to a pressure support of 20, stop calling a pressure supported breath. It's now a pressure control breath. And that's really important. Most people have a terrible time appreciating the difference between pressure support and pressure control. But really all it is, is the target is different. Pressure control, you have a higher target because you're trying to ventilate the whole lung. Pressure support, you have a lower target, you flow gas to a lower pressure because you're just trying to open up the airways to make it easier for the patient to breathe. So fantastic. In pressure support ventilation, the tidal volume is actually dependent on the patient's respiratory system compliance. You can set FiO2, you can set PEEP just like always. There is no set respiratory rate except if you are providing pressure support, which is basically BiPAP, invasive, intubated with your ventilator, if you're providing uh, pressure support, you always have a backup apnea rate. So I'm looking at whether or not my patient is ready to wean. He seems appropriate. He's passed his tests. I put him on pressure support ventilation, which means spontaneous breathing with a flow of gas to open up the airway. That's the pressure support. But if my patient has a period of time where he's not taking a breath, the ventilator will turn on 
won't allow them to become apneustic, won't allow them to have a respiratory arrest. We have a backup apnea rate. That's what's so phenomenally excellent about pressure support ventilation. So this is really a great way to wean patients. It's a really good way to do short-term ventilatory support basically just overcoming the resistance of the airway and making it easier for your patient to pull gas into the lung. It's a really great choice for many patients. And it's something that we should always be thinking about. So really only two modes for now, mandatory, the ventilator does the work, the ventilator controls the start and stop of the breath, and the target can be either volume or pressure. Spontaneous breathing, patient takes on the work. Patient controls the start and stop on a spontaneous breath. And there are mandatory breaths that can be delivered and they are timed if possible to the patient's effort. So you'd still give a combination of patient breathing and ventilator breathing, really phenomenal. So remember those two targets, volume control or pressure control can be given either with assist control or SIMV, but pressure control with a lower target not called pressure control, it's called pressure support. And I want to just remind you, pressure support should be less than 20. Usually we would say less than 18. Any pressure support greater than that is actually pressure control. And you can add PEEP to either one of these types of ventilation. So when you walk into your room at the beginning of your shift, uh, so I'm talking about the 840 and the 960 because those are the vents that we use here and these are the pictures that I've taken. But if you have basic principles, you can find this on any ventilator display screen. When you walk into the room, you look at their mode. Here's the mode right here, assist control. And next to that is the target. So if it's VC, that's volume control. Assist control is the mode. Volume control is the target. Those are not the same thing. So if I'm communicating to a provider and they say, well, what's his ventilation? He's on assist control with a volume target or he's on assist control with volume control. So I find that right next to each other, assist control and volume control. And up here on the top, which is what is actually being done in that moment, you actually will see C with a empty box C with an empty box means that that is a controlled mandatory breath, right? If the patient is assisting, you're gonna see a different color and a different letter. But if the breath is the mandatory breath right on time, you'll have that green C that tells you that that's a controlled breath. So right away, as I walk into the room in the morning, I'm not in charge of the ventilator, the respiratory therapist is, but I'm going to look at the mode and I'm going to look at the target and I'm going to see how my patient is breathing. Now, if your patient is getting controlled breath on all ventilators, the inhalation limb is green and the exhalation limb is yellow. So green, if it's a controlled breath, it'll be green. If it's an assisted breath, it will be green with a little red piece before it. But the controlled breath, the mandatory breath is green. So gas flows in, I'll go down here, this is flow. Gas flows in, gas flows out. Gas flows in, gas flows out. Now I'm on volume control. I'm on volume control. I don't need to look at your volume. What I want to look at if you're on volume control is the pressure that's being generated as the gas flows into the lung. So what you're seeing here is this is a pressure circuit. This is a flow circuit. And this is the pressure that's being generated in the airway as gas flows in. Now, remember, I'm not controlling that pressure. So the reason I want to look at it on the screen is I want to see, is that a problem? The pressure that is generated each time gas flows in is going to be displayed up here as P-peak or PIP, depending on your ventilator, it might say peak inspiratory pressure, PIP or P-peak, the peak pressure as gas flows into the circuit. And typically we want that to be below 40, right? If it's greater than 40, you've got a problem. You've got to figure out what the problem is. And that'll be at the end of this talk, I hope. Okay. so. Again, we're kind of looking at that assist control, volume control, a controlled mandatory breath, and that peak inspiratory pressure. And here I'm looking at 
SIMV, which means when I look below that, I see that 12 breaths will be delivered from the ventilator, but the patient can also take his own breaths, okay? And so when you look up here, you'll see at the time I snapped the shot, that was a spontaneous breath and it's red. Looking down here at uh, the, the inspiratory flow and the pressure, you see that as gas flows in, it's red. That's a spontaneous breath. Gas flows out, always yellow. Gas flows in, it's green. That's the mandatory breath. Gas flows out, it's yellow. Red, green, red, green, red, red, green, red, green. So in this cycle, I see one, two, three, four, five, six spontaneous breaths and one, two, three, four, five mandatory breaths and one breath that is most likely, oh, actually it's not, so never mind. Okay, so that's my SIMV. Now I look down here and we're gonna talk about this a little bit more. Here's the frequency, which is the respiratory rate. This is what I've set for the vent to deliver. But up here, you're looking at frequency total. That means the mandatory rate plus the patient rate. And that's much higher. The patient is breathing 28 times a minute. So it's such a nice thing to be able to just come into the room, look at what is your mode? What is your target? What is the breath you're on right now? And that gives me a really abundant amount of information. And now we're going to look at pressure support. Now, take a look at that. I go down here, which is the first place I'm going to look, and I don't see AC and I don't see SIMV. What I see is spontaneous, spontaneous, okay? So very important. That's the spontaneous breath. And when you're breathing spontaneously through that little teeny ET tube, you must always have pressure support. So the only time you're going to get pressure support is with a spontaneous breath whether it's SIMV or pressure support ventilation, you're always gonna have your patient on pressure support. You as the nurse will not allow intubation and ventilation to proceed with spontaneous breathing without pressure support. That actually just opens up the airway and overcomes the resistance of the tube. And so if you don't have that and you're asking a patient to breathe spontaneously, it's torture. You wanna guarantee your patient's gonna wear out and fail his spontaneous breathing trials and his ability to come off the ventilator, all you have to do is turn off pressure support because now I'm trying to breathe through that ET tube. Now you look up here and you see every breath is red on the in inspiration limb and of course yellow on the exhalation limb. Every breath is red. That's because I don't have any mandatory breaths. But if my patient stops breathing, remember I have an apnea backup on my ventilator that will make sure that the patient is getting breaths. So that's the basics of mode and target. Sometimes people will call me and they're calling me to tell me about an issue they're worried about with ventilation. They wanna know how to talk to their provider and they go, he's on assist control. Okay, that's great. That's the mode, but what's the target? Huh? I don't understand that, he's on assist control. Because it used to be that that used to be very common, you know, 18 years ago, if you were on assist control, it was always volume control. That's not true anymore. So you've always got to talk about the mode, assist control, SIMV, pressure support, and the target. Volume control, pressure control, pressure support. Those are the targets. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. I hope that means something to you. And I want to remind you, you never give a patient pressure with a ventilator. You don't really, you don't give pressure. You don't give volume. You flow gas. The ventilator flows gas into the lung to the target. Target is volume, target, target is pressure. That's it. It's pretty straightforward. Makes it a lot simpler for us to talk about. Now let's think about setting up when we set up after intubation and how we think about this as time goes by. So first and foremost, I'm going to talk, talk about treating patients' oxygen levels. And there's really only two things that we do to treat patients' oxygen levels. We treat them with FiO2, or we use distending airway pressure, what we call mean airway pressure. And in this context, because this is a basic class, it's going to be PEEP. So FiO2, distending airway pressures or mean airway pressures. And in this class, we're talking about PEEP. Okay, so first and foremost, FiO2. I like to always remind you that FiO2 
when I ask people, what does FiO2 mean? They go, a uh, fraction of oxygen that the patient's breathing. Okay, but that's what the initials are, but that's not really what this is. FiO2 means the fraction of the atmospheric pressure that the patient is breathing that is oxygenated. And so when we say you're on 100% FiO2, that's 100% of barometric pressure. Here in Georgia, that's seven, or, or here in Atlanta, that's 748 millimeters of mercury. So when I'm breathing 100% FiO2, I'm actually pulling in 748 millimeters of mercury oxygenated gas. At least half of that should go into my blood. That's a really simple thing to say. We can be much more complex and more scientifically accurate, but just in general, just when you say 50% of 748, okay, that's gonna be a problem for me, four or seven, oh, 347, roughly half of that should be reflected in my blood when I draw blood gas. So really important for us to appreciate that when we're blowing FiO2 at patients and we're increasing the oxygen concentration, we're washing out other gases. And the one we're most concerned about, of course, is nitrogen. But the higher the dose of oxygen, which is a medication, the higher the dose of oxygen, the more likely it is that that's gonna create some toxicity. So we always wanna be aware of FiO2. Now, when we initially intubate a patient, we're gonna put them on a high FiO2. We're gonna change that pretty quickly if the patient will tolerate it. We typically will start with 70% to 100% to ensure adequate tissue oxygenation. And then based on the SpO2 and most likely doing a blood gas within the first hour after intubation ventilation, we'll adjust the FiO2 accordingly because we wanna prevent oxygen toxicity. So if your patient is not well oxygenated at 70% to 100% FiO2, you have to go up on PEEP, that's your next step. If your patient is well oxygenated, they've got low PEEP and they're well oxygenated on 100% FiO2 right after intubation, you're gonna get that FiO2 turned down. Don't allow patients to languish under your care for two or three or four hours with a high FiO2 when they don't need it. Oxygen is incredibly toxic to the lung parenchyma and can actually be correlated to the development of alveolar damage such as ARDS. So don't let patients stay on high FiO2s. Okay, now let's just take a look at this. So I'm gonna give you your very first picture here. This is the uh, 960 and this is the 840. And you can see right here, down here is my settings board. This is telling me what I've set. So here's my FiO2 here. And here's my FiO2 over here. Oh, sorry. Here's my, oh, my FiO2 over here on the 840. So I'm just showing you where that is. And what's so lovely about your ventilator is what affects your oxygen. So that would be your FiO2 and your PEEP. They're always over on the right-hand side. They're a little separated from the other things that you're, you're actually performing to adjust your patient's levels. Okay, so now I just wanna, I'm sorry, this is just a, a, a very nice little video that just shows you about basic ventilation. So my patient's on assist control ventilation. It's volume control. His lung is compliant. But do you actually see that, you run it again, that every time he exhales, his alveoli collapse? So a large portion of the breath is spent trying to open up the alveoli. Now, in this patient, what we would typically see is that even though they're on a higher FiO2, they aren't oxygenating very well. So that's why we talk about PEEP we talk about PEEP to actually prevent alveolar collapse. Okay, so two things that we do with PEEP. The first one in the most basic setting is we intubate our patient, we set up a basic ventilatory strategy. We will normally actually place the normal basic PEEP from five to 10 centimeters of water pressure. Here at Grady, Typically, it's eight centimeters water pressure. That's the initial PEEP in anybody who's intubated on a ventilator. What that, do, what that PEEP actually does is it creates a constant gas flow 
to, again, a little pressure target, that pressure target being eight centimeters water pressure. And that gas flow actually keeps the alveoli open instead of allowing the alveoli to collapse. That's why we use PEEP. So lower levels of PEEP, five to 10, those actually protect the alveoli from collapse. But in patients who have lung parenchymal disorder, failure to oxygenate, and non-compliant lungs. So patients with ARDS, patients with COVID-induced ARDS, we're going to use a higher level of PEEP. So typically 10 to 20 centimeters. You can go higher than that. You could go 22, 24, probably at 26, you're going to need to figure a different form of ventilatory support. I'd love to talk about it, but it's beyond this lecture today. So just remember, when I apply P, what's actually happening is I'm refreshing the gas in the alveoli. So I have fresh gas, clean gas, which is very different than what you say with somebody who has COPD who doesn't recoil their alveoli. The gas that's in their alveoli is dirty. It's full of CO2. Now we really love P. Lower levels, five to 10. We start usually at grade eight. Lower levels prevent atelectasis and higher levels actually open alveoli that have been collapsed. So you can't really open alveoli with low levels. You just protect the alveoli that are already open with low levels. Higher levels recruit the alveoli and open them up. And one of the things that you actually can do with PEEP is because you're raising the pressure in the alveoli, that can force any fluid that's inside the alveoli out into the perivascular or the interstitial space. So that's a really nice trick with utilizing PEEP. Okay, so I'm so sorry because I thought the vid video, this other video was uh, behind the PEEP, but let's just take a look at this. It might be the same one. Uh-oh. Maybe I have it a little bit later. I hope so. Okay, so now I'm just going to remind you right under FiO2 is where is where you see the PEEP, right? So you can see this patient is on 100% FiO2 with 10 of PEEP. He's got very refractory hypoxia. And over here, this patient's on 30% O2 with five of PEEP. He has nice, beautiful, compliant lungs, and he's very responsive. The higher the oxygen, the higher the PEEP the more likely it is that the lung is non-compliant and your patient has refractory hypoxia. The lower the FiO2 and the lower the PEEP, the more likely it is that your patient's lungs are compliant. Here's my video. So I want you to look at this video. So you can see a lot of the lung is not recruited. So now we're gonna apply PEEP of around 12 and look what happened. All those alveoli pop open and you see just that small vibration there. That's the patient's breath. His, his alveoli are open. His oxygenation improves because we've kept the alveoli open with a higher degree of PEEP. So this is quite phenomenal. It's a wonderful thing to be able to do for your patients. Now, a tool that you can use here is the ardsnet.org backslash tools. And this is actually the ladder, what we call the ladder. And you can apply it to patients whether they have ARDS or not. That ladder is applied to actually remind you that you should do approaches for your patient in a stepwise fashion, if possible. Go up on FiO2 and then go up on PEEP. Go up on FiO2 and then go up on PEEP. And you can see here in this ladder, you go all the way up to 24, okay? And then here you're going up on PEEP and then you go up on FiO2. And this is called the ARDSnet PEEP FiO2 ladder. So it's a wonderful way for us to use basic science and evidence to communicate to our provider. The patient is hypoxic. He's on a high FiO2, but he's on a very low PEEP. Can we ask respiratory to increase the PEEP to see if we can actually open our alveoli. Remember that if people have open alveoli and good blood flow pass, they shouldn't need a high FiO2. If you are using a high FiO2, it means the gas that you're giving the patient is unlikely to have reached the alveoli. And that's why you apply PEEP as your first basic strategy to try to open the alveoli, what we call recruit the alveoli, open the alveoli in order to improve gas exchange. 
one of the things that I've noticed in my career might not be true where you are, might not be true from your perspective, but in my career, what I have noticed is uh, people are very frightened of using higher P. But the problem, and we should be really frightened of using high FiO2. So I want you to remember, if you're giving patients high FiO2 and they are not oxygenating well, the FiO2 you're giving is not reaching the alveoli. And your only strategy becomes, how can I open the alveoli? Now, as I open up the alveoli, the pressure in the thoracic cage goes up. That's going to compress the pulmonary vessels and put an extraordinary burden on the right heart. What that means is the left heart may not get its full capacity of volume. And what that means is your patient's blood pressure will drop. So when you're applying PEEP and your patient's blood pressure drops, the better choice is not to say reduce the PEEP, but to dilate the pulmonary vessels. And you do that with flow LAN or EPO or nitric oxide, whatever you use in your place uh, and whatever you're comfortable with, whatever your therapists have and whatever is uh, unfortunately most cost effective. And the reason we do that is because you need PEEP to open the alveoli, but now I've compressed the pulmonary vessels. So I'm gonna use that pulmonary vasodilation to open the pulmonary vessels so I can match blood and gas and improve your outcome. Okay, next thing we talk about is setting up to treat our patient's CO2. So when we talk about CO2, we're gonna talk about four things. Respiratory rate, known as frequency on your ventilator, the amount of volume that is being moved into the lung, that's your tidal volume, the respiratory rate times the tidal volume, known as the minute ventilation, and the time that your patient has to exhale. So these are all important. Four things. Sometimes people only think about two, respiratory rate and tidal volume. But it's really important to say respiratory rate, tidal volume, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. My Macintosh is going to go to sleep. It's saying it's going to sleep. So hang on. Oh, I see why I kicked the plug out. Sorry, I just didn't want to lose you because then we'd have to start all over. Not the, not the program, but we'd have to get everybody signed back up. So very, very important to remember that minute ventilation, and that's V with the dot over its subset capital E, minute ventilation is the respiratory rate times the tidal volume. So respiratory rate is variable, tidal volume is variable. Minute ventilation, normally we want patients to move around eight to 10 liters a minute. If they're retaining CO2, we're going to bump that minute ventilation up. But what you must always remember is you need to allow patients more time for exhalation. So when we first start on the ventilator, we're going to try to mimic what the patient's respiratory rate was before we intubated. Well, it was 28, so I might start you at 25. Take a look at the first blood gas, make some adjustments. Okay, so normal rate is 8 to 12. 12 to 20. I'm going to go a little higher if you were already breathing really rapidly before I intubated you. Okay. Now, slow rates, lower levels, eight, nine, are really helpful in patients who have actually chronic pulmonary disease because what they have is very large alveoli that don't have enough time to recoil. So you have to have them on a slower rate so their alveoli have time to recoil and they can exhale CO2. Faster rates can be useful for patients who have non-compliant lungs um, as long as you're using a, a small tidal volume and you're trying to assure that they have time for exhalation. So it's always really important when we're looking at our patients in that way. Okay, so on your ventilator, there's two tidal volumes that you see. You'll see a VT and you'll see a VTE, and we're gonna look at that in a moment on our display. VTE is exhale tidal volume, and that's what you always want to evaluate. So you're gonna set a tidal volume. That tidal volume is typically six to eight mLs per kg for predicted body weight or ideal body weight, which has nothing to do with weight. It's all about height and gender, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment. And what you want to see is that tidal volume actually fits the lung. So we're going to talk about something called plateau pressure, which looks at the pressure in the lung after distribution of the tidal volume across functional lung surface. But what we really honestly are going to care about as we're looking at our vent settings is not what we are delivering but what the patient is exhaling. 
This is the most accurate measure of the volume received by the patient with each breath. So that is really important. We're gonna look at that in our display on our ventilator. Okay, all right, oops, that's your flow rate. Here you go. Here's your VTE, okay? VTE, so I'm sorry, I think it said flow rate, but I meant for it to say, here's the tidal volume I set, 450. Here is the exhale tidal volume, 487. And that's gonna be really variable, right? I set a tidal volume of 450. This is what my patient exhaled. So on this breath, he exhaled more. On the next breath, he'll exhale less. On the next breath, he'll exhale more. So VTE on the 960 and the 840. So you can see VTE is the exhale tidal volume. Here's what I set. Here's what the patient is doing. Sometimes people get a little bit confused about that and a little upset. Like, well, why is that so different than what I set? Well, with each breath, you may may not have emptied all the gas. So what we're doing is looking at that over time. Okay. And the other part, of course, of minute ventilation is respiratory rate. And on your vent, that's always called F for frequency. So here's my set frequency. And here's my set frequency here, 20 here, 18 there. And then my total frequency, which is what I set on the ventilator plus any efforts that the patient made, whether it's a cis control or SIMV. You can see on this patient who's pretty sick, 100% FiO2 and 10 of PEEP, I would have him on 12, 14, 16 of PEEP. I want to get that FiO2 down. But you'll see he is not breathing over the vent. He's, we, we asked for 18, he's getting 18. This patient we've set at 20, he is also not breathing over the vent. He's got a frequency of 20. So they're, even though uh, what we, we've set up a capacity for the patient to take a breath, they're not getting their own breaths. Now, the other part of the ArtsNet, same website here, artsnet.org backslash tools. This is what, what your therapist uses when they set the tidal volume. So you can see this is for women, this is for men, and it's based on your height. It's based on your height and your gender. Here's your predicted body weight. And looking at four mLs, five, six, seven, and eight, don't recommend greater than eight ever for a tidal volume, except possibly for somebody with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, possibly. We're never really recommending more than eight mLs for KG of predicted body weight. What's so great about this tool is that your doc might say, I wanna put, a, I wanna put this patient on six mLs per KG of predicted body weight, we say, okay, the patient is 5'7". I'm going to come over here under 6 mLs. And it tells me exactly what tidal volume to set on the ventilator. Because on the ventilator, you're not setting it in uh, in mLs per, per, per predicted body weight per kilogram. You're setting the total tidal volume. Okay. Now, flow rate. Oh, the best kept secret in terms of ventilation and managing ventilation. Flow rate. What is flow rate? Flow rate is just the speed at which the gas is delivered to the target. So your target can be either volume or it can be pressure. And you're going to deliver the gas at a certain rate. So it's just like a rate of speed. You're, you're driving to LaGrange. You have a VW bus or you have a Ferrari. You get there faster in the Ferrari, but you still get there in the VW bus. It's just slower, right? That's what flow rate is. Flow rate is the rate of speed that gas is delivered. Now, in order for me to deliver gas fast, that means that the higher end of the flow rate, 80 liters per minute, at a rapid rate, your lung must be compliant. Okay, well, a chronic lunger usually has a compliant lung. I can flow gas in really fast. That allows them more time for exhalation. In a non-compliant lung, I need to open the lung. So I'm going to flow gas really slow. And that typically is what we do when we go on pressure control. We also think about inversing the ratio. Inversing the ratio means I'm slowing down the flow of gas, taking more time for inhalation and less time for exhalation. Of course, the caveat is if I have less time for exhalation, I may not remove CO2. So really, really, really important. Okay. Now, if I flow gas fast, the peak pressure, which is the pressure at the peak of the gas flow, peak pressure is going to go up. 
So you can't do that in a non-compliant lung. At a low flow rate, you're going to have an increase in inspiratory time, and you're also going to control that peak airway pressure, which is fantastic. Okay, so we can set the I to E ratio on the ventilator. We also, whenever we change the flow rate, we're always going to be setting I to E. Now, remember this guy on 100% FiO2 with 10 of P, he has a low flow rate. And that's because we already knew from his FiO2 and his PEEP that the probability is his lungs are not compliant. He has refractory hypoxia. So we're flowing gas a little bit slower for this patient. And he's in an IDE of 1 to 2.4. Okay. We go over here and we look at this patient. His gas flow is at the low normal or a little bit closer to the low normal, around 60. And his I to E ratio is one to four. Okay, big difference, one to 2.4, one to 4.4. This patient's spending much more time in exhalation. Now, part of that is because of respiratory rate, but the respiratory rates here are very similar, okay? So it really is related to whether or not your lungs are compliant, because I have to think about that. I can flow gas fast if the lung's compliant. I must flow gas slow if the lung is non-compliant. And that's really our flow rate. That's what affects the I to E ratio. And that is just the comparison of time spent in inspiration and time in exhalation. And normal I E ratio is one to two or greater, one to two, one to three, one to four. If your patient is retaining CO2, you'd like them to have a longer time in exhalation if your patient's lungs are non-compliant and you need to recruit the alveoli, you want to spend more time in inspiration. Now, you don't always have to set the IDE. The IDE is an end product of your respiratory rate, your flow rate, and how long you spend in inspiration. So those are a little bit more advanced concepts, but something that we should appreciate and understand because when we inverse the ratio, we've reduced the amount of time allowed to the patient to exhale, which means that they will frequently retain CO2. So again, that's your I to E ratio as you look at your patient. So I wanna remind you down here is what I've set and what I've talked about is your mode, your target, your respiratory rate, your tidal volume, your flow rate, your oxygen, and your PEEP. And the same thing over here, your mode, your target, your respiratory rate, your uh, volume target, over here, your FiO2 and your PEEP. This is what's been set, and up here is what's been delivered. And what's being delivered is not always the same as what's been set. And that's really important for us to remember. So we wanna know what the settings are, but we also have to look at what's being delivered. Okay, so initially when we start on the ventilator, these are initial guidelines that, that we use in general to help us understand how the ventilator is gonna be set up on initial intubation. And we should be sure that no matter where we work, I don't care that if you're in a CPR room with a cardiac arrest, somebody needs to be in charge of ventilator settings on initiation. So we're just gonna remember typically 70 to 100% FiO2. Tidal volume typically that we're gonna start with is six to eight mLs per kg by the predicted body weight calculator from the ARDSnet and a respiratory rate typically between 10 to 20, usually around 12 is what you start with. Flow rate, typically our defaulted flow rate on our fence is 60 liters a minute. We can go up or down depending on the lungs compliance. Lungs really compliant, you have COPD disease, you need to spend more time in exhalation. I'm gonna flow the gas faster, which shortens your eye time, prolongs your E time. If your lung is non-compliant, you need to spend more time with the delivery of gas across a larger surface, then I'm gonna turn the flow rate down. Remember the flow rate is just the rate of speed, you flow gas to your target, your target being volume or your target being pressure. Okay, so inspiratory time, typically we like to see it around one second and I to E ratio is one to two to one to three normally. 
Okay. Now, something I didn't talk about is sensitivity. And it's a little bit more advanced concept, but it's pretty straightforward. And that is that when, when we want patients to be able to take a breath, we have to make the ventilator sensitive to the patient. So both for assist control, patient-initiated breath, or for SIMV, patient-initiated breath, we're going to set typically, typically what we set is what we call the flow trigger. When the flow of gas, which is in the circuit, deviates to the patient because the patient made an effort, that's a flow trigger, the vent turns on and, and supports the patient. Uh, the pressure trigger is based on how much negative inspiratory pressure the patient might generate. So if you remember, sometimes when you're looking at weaning, you want to look at negative inspiratory force. How much negative pressure is the patient generating in the thoracic cage with diaphragmatic contraction? So that sensitivity is a little beyond what we want to talk about here today. And then P5 to 8 centimeters of water pressure. So really important to appreciate how, how it is that providers are looking at this so we can understand and anticipate. When your patient is excessively oxygenated, their PO2 is greater than 100, their SAT's 100%, we're going to decrease FiO2. Uh, we're, we're actually going to keep the IVE at one to two or one to three, and we are going to decrease the PEEP. So we can decrease FiO2, we can decrease PEEP, and we'll keep the same IVE ratio. If you have inadequate oxygenation, PO2 less than 60, a lot of times less than 70 can be our big concern, but really it's the SAT. SAT's less than 90, and actually with medicalized few patients, a lot of times they say, I'm okay if the SAT's 88% or greater, but just whatever the guidelines are in your area or with your, with your provider, that when your patient is inadequately oxygenated, you can increase the FiO2 and you can increase the PEEP. And remember using that ladder, increasing one and then the other and one and then the other is going to give you your best array of therapeutic interventions to help manage the patient. And then the other thing is to prolong your eye time. So to prolong inspiratory time, you reduce flow rate. The gas flows slower. It allows more time to open your alveoli. So prolonged eye time is the same as I to E. It's the same as decreasing flow rate. What that does is it gives an average pressure across the lung parenchyma, both the conducting airways and the alveoli, that's the mean airway pressure. Mean airway pressure strategies for us are PEEP and prolonging eye time. Those are basic mean airway pressure strategies when patients are refractory to oxygen, okay? If your patient has respiratory acidosis, you'd like to get rid of carbon dioxide, so their CO2 might be 45 or greater than 50, and their pH is less than 7.35, and they have pure respiratory acidosis. We're going to increase their tidal volume, but you have to be sure that the lung is compliant, right? If I increase tidal volume and my pressures go, my peak pressure or my plateau pressures go up, your patient's lung is not compliant. You can't do that, okay? So you're going to increase their respiratory rate. And I don't know what happened here. You want to prolong their exhale time. So here's the thing. I've got a patient with a CO2 of 60. He's not a chronic lung patient. His pH is 7.25. If I go in that room and I say, well, I don't want to increase the tidal volume because I don't want to damage the functional lung. I'm going to keep the patient at a low tidal volume. I'm going to go up on his respiratory rate. What I've done effectively is I've shortened exhalation time. So I have to stand at that bedside and say, does my patient have a peak inspiratory pressure that will allow me to flow gas faster. Now, that means when you're looking at the peak inspiratory pressure, you're going to say that pressure needs to be less than 30 for me to actually flow gas faster. If that pressure is already at 40, you can't flow the gas faster. You've got to flow the gas slower. That means that you're going to accept the CO2 retention. We call that permissive hypercapnia. When you have a lung that is non-compliant, I can't flow gas faster, I can't promote better exhalation, I just have to accept that you're going to retain CO2 because I'm going to try to oxygenate you. Now, respiratory alkalosis, a whole nother bird, always be sure that it's a problem and not a compensation, right? Patients breathe really fast because they're blowing off acid because you have metabolic acidosis, so in order to say you have respiratory alkalosis, your CO2 must be low and your pH must be high. 
Otherwise, I'm not messing with this because it's probably compensatory. If you actually have pure respiratory alkalosis, maybe we were over aggressive with the tidal volume, maybe we were over aggressive with the respiratory rate. So we'll decrease your respiratory rate and or we'll decrease your tidal volume. All right, very good. It's uh, about eight minutes to five. Um, I'd like to just talk very quickly about some troubleshooting with the vent, but I'm going to be finished at five o'clock. So hopefully you can stay with me. I, I want to appreciate how busy you are and I'm going a little bit over time. I'm talking as fast as I can, but these are also intense concepts. I don't want to be sure everybody's with me. Okay, so when we talk about troubleshooting patient ventilation, we really have to think about how the patient is responding to the ventilatory support and to try to make the ventilator fit the patient. All right, so the very first thing to remember is we always, of course, want to monitor our patient. We should assess them every two hours at least. And we always want to go in that room knowing the medical history, current diagnosis, if possible, and their clinical course. Why did they need to be intubated? What was their initial problem? Are they a CP COPD patient? Do they have a pneumothorax? Do they have ARDS? And the key components of monitoring are, are of course, basic vital signs. And always remember, ventilation and hemodynamics are intimate. So you must look at the hemodynamics of the patient. So in the most basic setting, you're going to look at your pleth waveform. You're going to look at your pulse pressure, systole minus diastole. You're going to look at your heart rate as it relates to systolic blood pressure. And then, of course, you can do more invasive measures if you're capable, if you have uh, tools that allow you to look at stroke volume. That's going to be a really important one with mechanical ventilation because that's the thing that gets manipulated the most. You look at your patient's comfort level. How many muscle groups are they using to generate a breath, right? Are they working hard to breathe? Is the chest expanding and, um, and uh, de-recruiting? Expanding and contracting, I guess, would be the best way, equally and synchronously. That's so incredibly important. Lots of times you can't see that with the naked eye. So for me, whenever I have a high pressure alarm, I go in that room, I pinch some skin over the sternum and make sure that my hands are moving equally with the breast. If they're moving disequally, even if it's slight, the probability is you have a pneumothorax. So really important to look at physical examination in this patient. You look at their pulses. Do they have an airway leak? Can they swallow? Is their abdomen distended? What kind of nutritional support are they getting? And of course, above everything else, ABG and or VBG. And look at your patient's behavior and complaints. So if they're awake enough to tell you they're uncomfortable, this is hurting them, they're not making that up. And tracheal intubation is really painful and something is stuck in your throat and it's continuously irritating. Typically, if patients are, were not agitated before you intubated them and they are agitated now, typically there's a failure of your ventilatory support to meet the patient. So sedating the patient really isn't always the best thing. He wasn't agitated before and now he's agitated and he got agitated after we intubated him. Now he's breathing through that tiny tube. So always consider that the ventilatory strategy may not be best for the patient. And that particularly relates to flow. Flow is something that we want to take a look at. Here at Grady, we have an adopt adaptable flow mechanism. You saw it earlier on one of the visuals that's called VC plus. And it means that the ventilator, which is very smart, is in direct communication with the patient. If the lung is more compliant, on this breath, the lung is more compliant, will flow gas faster. And on the next breath, if the lung is less compliant, will flow gas slower. Now that's, it's pretty smart on our ventilator, but depending on where you work, you might have a Hamilton ventilator, which is the smartest ventilator of all time. And this is a very well integrated relationship between the patient and the ventilator. We have a pretty good relationship. And especially in the, nine, the new 960, there's a much better relationship between patient and vent. And that's all about lung compliance. Okay, lots of issues that happen with vent alarms, low pressure, high pressure, low rate, no rate, high rate, high minute ventilation, uh, low oxygen, mechanical failure, low volumes. Again, lots of things that can happen. Can't know everything there is to know about the ventilator in a one hour talk, not even an eight hour talk, but maybe in a 16 hour talk and 15 years of practice.
But the most important thing is if an alarm is going off on your ventilator, look at the patient. Follow the tubing from the ET tube back to the ventilator. Make sure there's nothing in the tubing like fluid. Make sure that everything is connected. That's really important. If your patient is in distress, bag them with 100% FiO2 and call for respiratory therapy. If your patient is in distress, you don't have time to figure out what the problem is if you can't see it naturally. So the first thing is ET2 back to the vent. That can be done pretty quickly, looking for fluid, looking for disconnections. And if the patient is distressed and his sats are dropping off the ventilator and bag and have someone call for respiratory therapy. Don't allow patients who are alarming to be in distress because they are telling you that they cannot breathe. So always be sure your AMBU bag is in your room that is connected to oxygen. In general, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and have the oxygen on at all times. But if you don't wanna do that, just remember to turn it up to 15 max flow when you're getting ready to bag the patient. You don't wanna be bagging a patient with room air unless they're only on room air. Okay, so really important when you have a high pressure alarm, that's the most common alarm, that's telling you about really your peak inspiratory pressure. So when gas is flowing into the lung, that peak flow of gas is rushing into the lung, the high pressure alarm tells you that you have resistance to the flow of gas. Patient might be biting his E-tube, tonguing it. It might be displaced. You might have a mucus plug. You could have a pneumo, you could have a hemo, or you could have lost alveolar compliance. It's a really big evaluation with a high positive pressure. That's your peak airway pressure, known as your peak peak, or in, maybe in your place with your vent would be peak inspiratory pressure, same thing, peak airway pressure, peak inspiratory pressure. When I'm flowing gas into, trying to flow gas from the ventilator into the lung, I'm meeting up with resistance, okay? Now you call your therapist. Your therapist comes and the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna press a little button called the expiratory, uh, inspiratory hold button. What the inspiratory hold button does is it allows your patient to get a breath and then it does not allow the patient to exhale. So the gas is distributed across the functional lung surface. So this is an alveolar measure or a compliance measure. P plateau tells me about whether or not the lung is compliant, okay? So normal peak, normal peak with a normal volume breath should always be less than 40 to 45. And normal plateau, which is performed by your therapist by pressing the inspiratory hold button on the ventilator should always be less than 25. Now I have a pneumo. So my P plat is 40 and my P peak is 45. But the problem is the compliance of the lung. As I have a pneumo, I've collapsed the lung, right? I'm taking up space with free air and my lung surface has gotten small. So that's always something that your therapist is gonna do in patients who have a sustained high P pressure. They're always gonna do an inspiratory hold maneuver and they're gonna measure the P plateau. So I just wanna remind you, it's just a good concept for us to remember. If you have a high pressure alarm going off, make sure your patient isn't chewing the tube, biting the tube, make sure that the patient has synchronous ventilation, suction, make sure you can pass that suction catheter. And then you're gonna call your respiratory therapist because something's going on that you're not really seeing and you're not able to evaluate effectively, okay? Your, your therapist will come and check the plateau pressures. If peak pressures are high and plateau pressure is low, this is a measure of the alveoli and this is a measure of the whole airway circuit. So if peak pressures are high and plateau pressures are low, you've got an obstruction. If peak pressures are high and P plat is high, you have a lung compliance issue. Sometimes you may have a relatively normal P peak with a high P plat. Again, that's a compliance issue. If the lung is non-compliant, you've got to rule them out for pneumo, for hemo. And then guess what? You're going to say, oh, look, we're on a high FiO2 and a kind of low PEEP but my patient's lungs are non-compliant. Doc, what do you think about going up on the PEEP? Respiratory therapist, Derek, 
what do you think about going up on the PEEP? Can we try that? Because our patient's lung is non-compliant. Now, I'm only truly going to know the lung is non-compliant if I do a PEEP plat. Remember, PP talks about the flow of gas into the ET tube and the conducting airways to the alveolus and all of which is engaged inside the thoracic cage. So lots of things affect this. Really, really important. So we just want to understand the difference. High peak, low plateau, usually something to do with the airway. ET tube block, biting, bronchospasm, mucus plug. High peak, high plateau, that occurs with ARDS, with peak, uh, pulmonary edema. With the pneumothoraces, if your ET tube has gone into the just a single bronchus and you're just ventilating one lung, and will also happen when you have an effusion. Well, that's pretty straightforward. These are things I need to be aware of when I come to the bedside of my patient. So we're at five o'clock. There are some other things I'd like to talk about. I'll probably engage them next time and correlate them with the P to F ratio and end tidal CO2 in terms of how we manage the ventilator. And I um, either will do that next Tuesday or I will do it next Thursday, looking at this structure in terms of how we manage the ventilator. I hope you feel like you've gained some new knowledge or that you've confirmed knowledge that you already have. Remember, I'm going to stop recording, but then I'm gonna be open for questions. And I wanna thank you very much for your commitment to patient care, for your commitment to growing your knowledge and applying new knowledge and new strategies and new methods at the bedside to do the best that you can for your patients. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate you. Bye-bye for now.